happening. So thank you. All right, and uh, Chris, real quick, can you see the screen okay? Did I share properly? Yeah, looks great. <laughs> okay, just making sure. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely, this. absolutely. All right. All right. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> thank you so much for, for being a part of this event this morning. Um, I was just talking to Lori and Chris. It, it's such a fantastic opportunity for coaches and mentors to share across our state and, and give each other advice and guidance as we approach, you know, the first Lego league season this year. So I'm really honored to be a part of this. And, and so thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Chase. This is my 14th uh, first Lego league season. Um, so I guess I'm a bit of a veteran now. I really love the program and watching the kids grow in it. So I'm, I'm excited to share some stories and thoughts with you today. I've been asked to talk about the robot design presentation with integrated core values. For any of our veteran coaches out there, it's important to understand that when the students go into a presentation room now, they're gonna be presenting to a group of judges. Whereas in the past, we used to have three different presentations the students would work for, work towards the robot design presentation being one and then a core values presentation and a project. But now it's in one room. And what the core values judge is looking for is integrated core values within the robot design presentation and in the project presentation. So I'd like to start there. Oops, get the right button here. Sorry about that. Okay, going too fast. All right. So one of the challenges your team is, is going to have this season is to design, build, and program a custom robot to solve the mission models on the Cargo Connect game map. At the competition, the team will use the results of their robot work in two different areas. One of them will be in a robot competition where they compete for three rounds to earn the maximum points that they can at that time. The second one, the second use of their, their robot work is in the presentation where the workmen, they're gonna present their workmanship to a panel of judges. And this is the robot design presentation. So we're gonna back up a little bit and talk about the core values. So before we look at the re requirement of the presentation, we need to review these core values. They are the basis for everything we do in FIRST and should be integrated not only into the presentations, but into the culture of the team as well. So let's start by looking at the core values rubric. And for those new coaches, a little clarification, these rubrics are available, are readily available right on the FIRST website and this is the tool that the judges are using to calibrate the different teams and review how they performed this season. So it is good for you to understand what the judges are looking for from your team. That doesn't mean they can't have fantastic successes outside of this matrix, but you do want to make sure that they're achieving the different things that are in uh, the rubrics. So the first one for in core values is discovery. The team explored new skills and ideas. Well, you're going to see so much fantastic discovery happen throughout the season in robot and in, 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 in the project for sure. Um, but whether your team has veterans or rookies, there are a lot of opportunities for discovery throughout the season. Our team enjoyed the process of naming itself and designing a new logo. So each season, they would really spend a lot of time on this. So that this sample here, a couple of years ago, they were learning about water and they were specifically focused on Uganda, Africa. And in the village, there were three different words that seemed to be appropriate for water and water carrying. And this team got excited about the word Amazi. <clears throat> so then they started working on the dry erase board and writing down different ideas. And you could see some sketches there behind the young lady of waves kind of going up against that word. And then above the young man there, you see a picture of the Ugandan flag. So they took the idea of the wave and the colors of the Ugandan flag and created a team identity that, that worked into their team shirts that year. So this was a discovery element and it was you know, on purpose of the team to really explore that and, and enjoy that as part of a core values activity. Innovation, the team used their creativity and persistence to solve problems. This is probably one of the hardest things to watch but you have to let them fail and you have to believe in their ability to succeed. 
it's when they succeed that they're going to have the greatest triumphs, but they have to, they have to stub their toes first. Um, it, as a coach, you, sometimes you want to lead them to an answer that you think might be appropriate or, or over guide them, but you've got to step back and let them fail so that they can grow and, and build their self-confidence in that. Impact. <clears throat> the team applied what they learned to improve their world. If you have time, try to find an opportunity to get the team out of their practice area and into their community where they can talk about first and the first Lego league. Their self-confidence will grow as they explain what they've learned to strangers. And it's a very, very rewarding process. <clears throat> so we do that through outreach. Now, this picture is an example of Brickworld. Um, Brickworld is uh, held, I think, in five different locations now uh, throughout the Midwest. They hold one in Fort Wayne, and they also hold one in Indianapolis. The Brick World coordinators are really good to work with us um, as First Lego League representatives, so you could reach out to them. Um, they really like us to be at their shows. It's a celebration of the Lego product and Lego creators, and to have the First Lego League students there showing how Lego can be programmed and turned into robotics is very, very exciting. So we've enjoyed that one. And then an, another example is um, we're not too far away from Chicago. So we'll head over to Chicago to the Museum of Science and Industry and participate in National Robotics Week. So we have a lot of robot enthusiasts there and then they get to learn about FIRST and what uh, FIRST LEGO League is. So it's really exciting. Other outreaches that are definitely in your area would be with Barnes and Noble booksell booksellers. They really like to have the students come in and even today, we're out in the community at a, a touch a truck event. Uh, we have two teams out there, and they're do, they're showing their Lego robots and and letting students build Lego trucks um, as part of that that event. So, look around in your community and see if you can get the students out there. What's exciting is not only are they making the community more aware of first, but they are putting themselves in uh, in front of a stranger, and they're having to talk about what they've created and why they did it that's really good for them because it gives them some experience before they get in front of the judges inclusion <clears throat> this is so important a team demonstrated respect and embraced their differences we need to have equal involvement and equal voice i've never seen a successful first lego league team that you know one person did all the programming or one person built the robot and everybody else just watched it really needs to be equal involvement and equal voice as a coach, you're going to spend most of your time wrangling all the attention of the students to try to make sure they all have a voice and that everyone's being respected and heard. That goes right into teamwork. Teamwork team clearly showed that they had <clears throat> that they had worked as a team together through their journey. One way I like to do this is, uh, I'm sorry. One way I like to get the team to not only embrace teamwork but also make sure it's in it is included is to brainstorm on the whiteboard. In general, I like to hold the marker and write down everything the students say. <clears throat> we would go around and around the table multiple times to make sure that everyone expressed every thought. And after a long session of brainstorming, it wasn't uncommon to have a vote among the team to see which ideas deserved more discussion and attention. So I, it really, really helps get them to talk in front of their teammates and know that their voice and their idea is important. They'll, they'll say silly stuff, and I always apologize that I can't spell everything that they say, but we really try to capture all those thoughts. And then as the air clears a little bit, go back and vote, and you'll be surprised to see what the team comes on. Okay. Another thing that we do, another great teamwork technique, is what we call our show and tell. For the last 10 minutes of every practice, teammates will show what they had been working on and explain some of the successes and challenges that they had. This is important because they learn how to, to talk and verbalize what they saw in their head, what they were working on. And then this is a time for teammates to kind of chime in and give them some advice and guidance. So we really try to let the student work an hour or an hour and a half in a small group before everybody gets to jump in and, and start, you know, giving too many thoughts that might derail what their, their path of thinking is. 
So equal involvement, equal voice, brainstorming, and show and tell, all of this really goes hand in hand. They make sure everybody's feeling included, and then that's going to increase your teamwork. And lastly, fun. The teams clearly had fun and celebrated what they've achieved. Try to get out of your practice facility for a team bonding event. You really only need to do one of these things. But if you can get out and do some sort of a group activity, like play miniature golf together or have a pool party, it really helps the team bond. It's amazing what a couple of hours in one afternoon will do for the, the culture of the team. Okay. So now let's look at the robot design rubric and what the judges will be looking for from your team. The first one is identify. <clears throat> the team had a clearly defined mission strategy and explored building and coding skills they needed. It's really important that your students understand and, and you as a coach understand that this rubric applies to both the Lego blocks, the, what, how they built the robot, and the coding behind how the robot moves. They're not mutually exclusive. In the past, they, there was a little bit of an exclusion where programming was kind of its own subcategory, but it's not anymore. They're one and the same. So we need to make sure the team has a strategy. That's the key word there. So this graphic here is a picture from a couple of years ago, and the team chose to do five launches that season. So each one of these color-coded arrows represents the path the robot was gonna go. Back then we called it base, but now it's the launch zone. So the robot would leave the launch area, travel down this path, and then hopefully return to the launch areas in, as it was hoped. <clears throat> we broke the team into sub teams. So the number one arrow there would be one or two students working together on just that quadrant of the table. And then same with the rest of the numbers. Now you'll notice up where it says hydrodynamics up in that corner, there are no arrows. The team's strategy was to not navigate into that quadrant. They found it difficult to get there and not very rewarding with points. So they chose to just focus on part of the board. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Especially rookie teams, if you can even do half the things on the board, that would be very impressive. The, the board's complicated this year and there's a lot to, to try to accomplish. And then we see it here again, this all team members, they're looking for evidence that all team members were part of this. So this is that inclusion that we saw in the core values. <clears throat> now, this is an example of what happens when you let the students use the marker at the dry erase board. They have a tendency to draw right all over the place and squiggly lines and burn up the markers as fast as they can. But what this was is they were talking through how the robot was gonna work. And you can see that some of these phrases are do this while doing this, you know, leave this element while picking up this element. This was their early strategy brainstorming session. Okay, design. The team produced innovative designs and a clear work plan, seeking guidance as needed. So as I already mentioned, I really encourage sub teams. Um, any team that's over four students, you're going to have way too many hands to keep them all busy during a meeting time, especially if you hit the maximum of 10 students on a team. That's a lot of hands around one robot. So if you break the board into sub teams and have students work together to solve those different missions in that area, then that works really well and everyone feels like they're involved. So here's an example. These two students work together on this contraption. And it was, again, just to solve one part of the board. So while other students were working on other areas, these two were working really hard to get um, this contraption to work. And then the other one, the other point under design is to try to be innovative. Encourage your students to use innovative ways of solving things. Now, we run a fine line between innovative and complicated. Don't make it complicated for complicated sake. But if there's an innovative way to solve it using something that might be a little bit unusual from the Lego um, you know, book of parts that you have, that's fine. So this is the finished version of the contraption those two gentlemen are working on. And you'll see some air gauges down there. This particular contraption ended up having two different 
Lego pneumatic systems in it. So they were just using minimal motor power, but by having things move, it was triggering um, pneumatic cylinders that then would fire other movements. So there was some innovation within their contraption. Okay, create. The team developed an effective robot and code, there's that code again, solution matching their mission strategy. So the team is gonna need to work on a presentation so that they can explain what they worked on. So they're gonna wanna write their presentation down. Um, this is an example of the teammates starting to organize a presentation and put it in a logical order. Um, one of the challenges that they have, they, they've had 10 to maybe 14 weeks to create this robot and they're very proud of it, but they can only talk for five minutes as a team. If you have 10 students, you're, you're down to you know, half, half a minute, 30, 35 seconds a kid talking about it. So they have to be real spe specific about what they're gonna say. It might not be as important that they memorize a presentation, but if one student's going to be talking about you know, what they created or what how they programmed something, they want to make sure other students don't say the exact same thing or they're going to run out of time. And of course, make sure that you're including a sample of code. Now, just like building, some students are going to want to do coding more than building. I, I really push for inclusion. I like all students to have experience doing all things. But we also have what we call our champions. You will have a student who really enjoys programming and he or she might become kind of your programming champion on your team. What that means is I encourage every student to program, but when they're stuck, when they can't figure out how to get the line follow to not be so wiggly or whatever, then you're allowed to ask the champion questions. So instead of saying, hey, this one person is our programmer, you do everything, I'm just going to build. The attitude is more, I'm going to try. And if I get stuck, I'm going to ask the, the lead or the champion programmer on the team to answer the questions for me. And the same thing happens with build. Iterate. The team repeatedly tested the robot and code to identify areas for improvement and incorporated the findings into their current solution. Now, this is a, the clarity on this one is a little bit new on our rubrics. It's always been there and the students will do this effortlessly. From the day they opened up the package and started building the robot, they started iterating, they started changing, they started making it better. That's a natural for them. The challenge here is the evidence. And this is where you as coaches can help them. Almost all coaches are, are having a cell phone with them now with a camera on it. Um, some of the students even have phones at this point with cameras. If you see them start to do an iteration where they're going to, to you know, take a major um, axle area off and, and try something else, have them pause, have them take a picture. It's really important that you have the evidence of the iterations. The judges are going to understand what you're bringing into the competition isn't where you started. But what the rubric here is asking for is evidence of growth during the season. So right from the beginning, start having someone or you could even help capture these photographs because 10 weeks from now, when you get ready for competition, the students are going to ask, hey, coach, do you have any pictures of my early developments? And if you didn't take them, you don't have them. So make sure you get that evidence for them. So document those iterations. All right, so here's an example. <clears throat> this uh, red arm here has a couple gears on it and, and, and we call them switchblade gears. It's another little gear rack in here. And the young man that was working on this was trying to get his rotary movement of a motor to push something out linearly. So he was trying to take rotation and, and make it go in a line. So that was his first investigation on it. That started to make sense to him. And so he um, started making like, a, we call it like a base robot or a frame just to start to make that push movement. And you can see he's looking at some different gears in this second iteration, trying to figure out how can he push that um, mission model over. Then that starts to develop into this. So he decided to 
get away from what we call our switchblade gears and move into a true gear rack. And he made it longer because of where the robot was going to be positioned on the table. <clears throat> so you can see here, he's got the one long yellow beam going across there with the, the driving gears underneath it. So that's how he moved up and, and decided to make this um, left to right movement. His next iteration, he's added a second beam. So he found once he got that movement working that there was a, a second reason to have a movement. So he created a second beam at a different height. So now he was able to use what he learned in the first one and apply it quickly to a second one. And then this is his final contraption. So clearly when he came to the competition, he didn't start with this pile of yellow bricks. He, he took a lot of hours to get there, but it was the documentation of those iterations that really helped him um, not only explain what he had done, but remember himself what all he had gone through to come up with this uh, technique of moving the mission models. And then lastly, communicate. The team's explanation of the robot design process was effective and showed how all team members were involved. Again, we have the inclusion. So this is the presentation itself. The students definitely need to have ownership. So part of helping them have ownership is the fact that they actually did the building and actually did the programming. You can have them um, prepare words for them to say, but a judge will always see right through that. You cannot fake the twinkle in the eye. When they own it, it is just a wonderful experience to talk to that student and, and get to see why they created what they did. So you're gonna have them practice that. Practice in front of their parents who might not be at most of the team meetings or grandparents or people they're not used to, to, to talking about robotics to that might ask some off the wall questions. And as I mentioned, even in outreach, we're not usually talking about this season's robot, but just talking about first, it gets them comfortable with hearing questions on the spot that they don't anticipate and coming up with answers for it. And have them practice and practice and practice, asking each other questions and helping them come up with clear ways of verbalizing what they created and, and how they did it. Okay, so uh, good luck to everyone this season. And now we'll open it up for some questions. Feel free to 